The sign stands just off US Highway 19, about 60 miles north of Marietta. From that point, it directs traffic down the access road to Air Force Plant 67, operated for the United States Air Force by Lockheed Georgia Division. Not too many months ago, this 11,000 acre site at Dawsonville was only an expanse of wooded hills. Then the bulldozers moved in. They came, did their jobs, and moved on. And behind them, buildings began to grow, structures designed to house the complex instruments of nuclear science. Among them, the reactor building, crux of all Georgia nuclear laboratory operation, is pushed toward completion. Assembly must get underway. In time, assembly begins. First, the 28-foot pressure vessel is hoisted out over the reactor pool. Forty feet down, the vessel will rest on a hydraulic lift by which the reactor will be elevated to operating position. On the floor, the shield tank is separated into sections for mounting. And when installation is completed, the tank completely encircles the pressure vessel. Down below, the primary water system begins to take shape. Through this system, water from the reactor will be circulated through the heat exchangers located in the primary equipment pit, underground and adjacent to the reactor building. Here, the water will be cooled before its return to the reactor. As work goes on, the grid and scram damper assembly is brought into position for lowering into the pressure vessel. At the top, the intersecting members of the grid form square receptacles into which fuel elements will be inserted. Next to come is the inner tank. Under careful handling of controls, it goes into the pressure vessel without loss of time. In other areas, support facilities are shaping up as well. Storage tank and cooling tower for the reactor water are already in operation. And downhill from the reactor, but separated from it by a shielding wall, the drain and hold tank also is functioning. Radioactive water from the reactor will be held in this tank until it is safe to pump it to a seepage pit back in the hills. Here, every precaution will be used to assure safe disposal once operation begins. As for fresh water, it's available in ample supply from the Etowah River. On the river bank, a pumping station sends the water directly to the water treatment plant for purification before passing into a 400,000 gallon storage system. Plant protection is in charge of the firefighting equipment based at a central location in the main area. Nearby is the warehouse through which flows a steady stream of supplies as varied in character as the departments for which they're intended. But of all support units, the critical experiment facility is most direct in its relation to operations. Center of its activity is the critical experiment reactor, where tests of source material are made to determine suitability for use in the main reactor. In essence, the elements go through a careful sorting process to determine their relative nuclear worth. In the nuclear support laboratory, are housed the administrative offices along with other important units. These include the weather station where latest reports are analyzed in the light of their possible effect on reactor operations. The station is on the alert, the radar scope keeping a sharp eye on the weather all over North Georgia. At the same time, detection devices for other purposes are being fashioned in the nuclear instrumentation lab. These devices may concern themselves with neutrons or gamma rays or radioactive argon gas. Whatever the nature, each instrument is given careful preparation for field service. For argon gas, this necessitates removal of air from the detector cylinder, producing an odd-looking inhale-exhale action in the cylinder skin. Field stations ordinarily are shared by three instruments, those for argon, neutron, and gamma detection. Electronic systems for the units are installed in an underground receptacle, an advantage to the all transistorized systems since it holds temperature variations to a minimum. Another detector in sharp outline, 
the 320-foot audio tower which warns of aircraft approach. Flying in the area is restricted to 5,000 feet, and advance warning will permit emergency shutdown in case of violation. And finally, there are the towers from which regular samplings of argon gas are made. Heavy concentration of the gas can result in a dangerous level of radioactivity. At the Radiation Effects Laboratory, construction is in its final stages. This lab will be the first to which test articles come on arrival. Once inside, each test article will be mounted on a railroad car and delivered to the hot cell mock-up for disassembly and reassembly as required by the test. It's necessary to prove that assembly work on the article can be done with manipulators, since after irradiation, this will be the only means of handling the material. Personnel and equipment are kept active, both in the interest of personnel training and maintaining the equipment in sharp order. Most of the assignments will require a sense of certainty and a precise handling that only constant practice can produce. The use of these artificial hands requires as much skill in restoring tools to their proper place as it does to perform the job in the beginning. Before operations begin, the hot cells are undergoing a rigid checkout for possible radiation leaks. The Thousand Curie source travels in both lateral and vertical patterns so that all surfaces of the cells are exposed. Outside, a detector follows each movement meticulously. Nothing can be left to chance, as all test articles will come to the hot cells after irradiation. In operation, the hot cells will be highly versatile. Converted into a single room, four railroad cars can be accommodated with ease, or the space can be divided into as many as four separate cells by means of huge partition blocks, three feet thick and weighing up to 12 tons each. The analytical lab is already functioning smoothly. Here, the effects of radiation on the test articles will be analyzed and recorded, and the records used as a basis for evaluation. It is expected that from findings in the analytical lab, will come some of the answers needed for nuclear flight. The railroad between the Radiation Effects Laboratory and the Radiation Effects Facility is two and a half miles long. It crosses the Etowah River and enters the hill country. Then, after a brief journey, emerges in sight of the reactor building. This building is virtually surrounded by hills, and is located well away from other surface buildings. Inside, assembly of the reactor is nearing completion. Upper closure and equipment tank are going on and are soon followed by the top cover. Meanwhile, in the underground operations building, the engineers are setting up a functional test. December 15 is the day for the reactor to go critical. And by now, December 15 is just down the road. So the tests are set up and run, not one, but several of them. They're rigid, and their results are satisfying. Shortly afterward, the startup source having arrived from the critical experiment reactor, underwater transfer is made. All that remains now is the loading of the core. Everything is in order, and so it's decided to go ahead. Sunday, December 14. Rehearsals are over. This one is real. Margin for error, zero. The loading goes forward. In the background, a quiet voice speaks into a telephone, and its message is repeated from the control room by loudspeaker. Number 17 in R7. And again. Number 22 in P7. The control room will log it all. 23 in M5. 29 in R5. Number 33 in R3. 32 in N2. And 31 in P2. Button it up. On December 14, 1958, the Dawsonville reactor went critical. Capable of irradiating six railroad cars of material at once, 
This facility of the Air Force is the most extensive ever activated for the study of nuclear effects on large aircraft systems. Since the day of criticality, the reactor has been undergoing constant test and observation. And as the first quarter of 1959 becomes history, Georgia nuclear laboratories look to the time when full-scale operations will begin, firm in the belief that from this Air Force research facility may well come the answers to speed the day of atomic flight.